Good evening, my name is Christina Groff and I'm here with Tri-C's Channel One. And this evening I have with me Coach Tyrone White. Good, so good to have you here. Thank you. So you just created a video de detailing sexual assault or how, what, tell me the details on that, what you just did recently. Yes, I just did a video yeah. on recognizing child predators. Okay. Yeah. Or what we refer to uh, the triple P's, perpetrator, predator, pedophiles. Oh, wow. And you can find that video if you go to YouTube and go to CoachTyVideo.com, mm -hmm. CoachTyVideo.com, and that's T-Y, CoachTyVideo.com. Yeah. And so what is the, tell me, where did you get the idea to do this video? How did that come about for you? Well, it's as a result, Christina, of yeah. everything that's been going on at Penn State. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing issues at Syracuse University and also there's another military academy School, yeah. where they've had some issues. And the truth, Christina, is this. Uh, only 10% of all the children that have victim, been victimized come forward. And so when we look at the issues of sexual abuse against children, most go unreported. And so with that and everything that has surfaced with Penn State and the other schools, I felt it necessary to provide real substantive information. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about the, you know, what the information says on your video. Like, what do you tell parents? I tell them, Christina, all the things that they don't tell you mm, yeah. about child sexual perpetrators. Yeah. And the thing that they're not telling you, Christina, is that you can do a background check until the cows come home. But when you catch a predator for the first time, they have no criminal record. And they victimize, on average, 32 people. And so it's more imperative that we teach parents, we teach coaches, we teach administrators how to recognize the signs and then uproot it once you recognize it so you don't have a tragedy under your own watch. Hmm. So what would be some of the signs to even look for, you know, in a predator? Well, one of the signs is anytime they offer gifts, mm -hmm. we call it grooming, mm -hmm. uh, offer anything to a child without asking permission of the parent. Uh, they seek to put the child in a position where their options are cut off from having mm -hmm. access to support systems and other people. Uh, they try to turn them in and against their support system by saying subtle things like, you know, your parents really don't want you to grow up. That's why they really don't trust you mm -hmm. to make your own decisions. Manipulative almost. It's very manipulative. And this is why they get away with it over and over again. Mm -hmm. So this video teaches people how to recognize it and respond. Wow. So it's, it's, teach, it's, it's like equipping almost parents, like how, here's what to do before anything happens. So how do, you, how do you teach your children then? How do you, you know, not just the parents, but how, well, how do you teach children, you know, to be prepared for a situation like this? That's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, because as we talked earlier, you don't want to traumatize children. Mm -hmm. You don't want to talk to them about the creepy, scary man, you know, yeah. in the shadow, yeah. you know. Uh, so how we teach parents to teach their children, we teach them to teach situations. Mm -hmm. If someone, let's say you're lost and you've been separated from mm -hmm. your parent at Walmart, mm -hmm. and you ask a guy who has a, a blue jacket for help, mm -hmm. And he seems friendly, but he asks you to go to the back of the room, mm -hmm. the storeroom or the restaurant mm -hmm. or the, uh, the Walmart. Right. Uh, that's not appropriate. That person really should be guiding you to a highly trafficked public place where there are a lot of people and not seeking to isolate you. Mm -hmm. And so if you ever are in a situation like that, I would say to parent, you teach the child those specific situations and not people because it could be male, female, teenager or old man hmm. wow so it's not really it's not just i mean it's a variety of different people it sounds like yes That's, now are there online predators as well i mean there it sounds like we've got to be careful from both not just in real life but online as well there's a whole different formula mm. that sexual predators use online mm. and first they start by going into chat rooms or to areas where they know children will be and then one of the things they do is called a silent interview. They'll just sit back and watch the flow of communication. And they're looking for a child to articulate that they've just had an argument with their parent uh, or they're thinking about running away. Uh, and that's the person that that predator will isolate on and speak to. And then from the confines of the chat room, that sexual predator 
will lure that child into what's called IM, instant messaging, mm -hmm. where there's one-on-one -on -one communication. Mm -hmm. And let's back up to the chat room. Children don't know that when they're in chat rooms communicating, there could be 40 to 60 people observing that may not be saying anything. I didn't know that. <laughs> and so you think you're just having a conversation with your buddies, but there are other people that could be trolling, looking for that vulnerable kid mm -hmm. that's kind of confused. Mm -hmm. And that's who they connect with. That's who they try to extract from that chat room into IM. And then the game starts. And then eventually it moves towards gifts. Uh, they like to send two most popular gifts, cell phones and watches. They'll convince the child that they can be trusted, that I'm going to send you this, but I don't want to know your address. I'll just send it general delivery to the post office in your town. And all you have to do is show up with identification, and it can be a school ID, and pick up this gift, and your parents will never know. Well, why do they send cell phones and watches? Because, Christina, they have GPS devices in them. So the child, upon receiving that gift, thinking that they're keeping a secret from their parent, talking late at night so the parent can't trace it with a cell phone they're paying the bill on for the child, then suddenly this perpetrator predator pedophile knows where the child lives and also may know other personal things about the child, such as them going to skating parties, where they may be, and how to access them, even when the child is not aware that this person is in that environment. Wow, this is a really scary issue that's going on right now. It is very scary. And what really is more alarming is when parents don't know. Mm -hmm. When people that have camps, YWCAs, YMCAs, church groups, youth groups, they don't know. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm here to provide just, this information. And that's what your video is primarily about, is t t equipping parents and teachers to know how to handle these things. Exactly. Wow. Hi, I'm Coach Ty, and I'm going to lead you through a scenario where you will actually see the steps that a perpetrator predator pedophile takes to uh, victimize a child, to sexually assault a child. Today we're going to take you in this make-believe world of a camp, the first day of camp when all the children arrive and there's that one camp counselor who is different from all the others. And I want to see if you can pick up on the steps because as you see how the seduction, how the manipulation takes place, you will begin to understand why the first time we catch a perpetrator, predator, pedophile, they have no criminal record and they victimized on average 32 people. So instead of being Coach Ty for this scenario, I'm going to take on the role of Mr. Whipple and I am going to uh, meet this individual. Now, first of all, I took this job because I really enjoy working with children. And I'm very selective. So I watched all the children get off the bus, and I'm paying attention to the children, and I'm looking for that one who doesn't have a lot of friends, who's not hanging around anybody else, and I find him. Hi, I'm Mr. Whipple. How are you? You're 12, right? Good. What's your name? James. 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 You know, James, one of the things that we do at summer camp, and so glad you're here, is we have a junior camp staff member. And that junior camp staff member is one of the campers. And what I do that none of the other supervisors do here is I give my junior camp staffer a T-shirt that says junior camp staff. Would you like to be junior camp staff? You know what you'll get, James, is you'll get extra snacks. You'll also get extra swimming pool time, okay? So James goes off and he cleans up after lunch. And so Mr. Whipple walks up and affirms James. James, great job. Really appreciate it, buddy. James continues to do his work. Part of his assignment is he also will pick up the towels after swimming pool time so that we can clean them and get them ready for the next day. So he's doing a great job. He's been affirmed again. James, that's a great job. You got all the towels up, so we're ready to wash them for the next day. I really appreciate it, James. So glad you did that. Now, 
James has been promised several things. Now remember, he's also been given a t-shirt, right? That says junior camp staff. Uh, you also note that he's getting this extra attention in addition to the privileges of extra snacks and swimming pool time. So here's the other benefit. James, remember I promised you extra swimming pool time? Well, today is your lucky day, but you know, I noticed that some of the other junior camp staff seem like, or not junior camp staff, but other campers, unlike you, they seem to be looking at you like they're a little bit jealous. So we're going to wait until all the other campers are asleep, and I'll come wake you up, and you'll get a full 30 minutes of swimming pool time. Would you like that? Okay, I'll get you after everybody's asleep. So James is woken up by Mr. Whipple when all the other children are asleep, the other campers, and he's told this, James, come on with me. You can jump in. Uh, I'm going to be over here doing some paperwork, and I'll give you about 30 minutes, and then after 30 minutes is up, you can change and go back to the dorm. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So in the meantime, James jumps in the swimming pool, and Mr. Whipple has props. So if someone could give me a book or some papers, I see it over there, okay? And we're going to see just how methodical and devious this is. So we're getting Mr. Whipple's prop off stage, and he's coming back, and he approaches James that's in the swimming pool. James, I need you to get out of the swimming pool. I've been reading through the reports and found that one of the campers used the bathroom in the swimming pool earlier today. We're going to have to drain it overnight while you guys are asleep, and I'm going to have to collect your swimming gear because we're going to have to put that in a biohazard bag. Also, I know your mother doesn't want you to get sick, and I'm going to have you just jump in and shower and throw your trunks out, and then I'll throw some clothing in. There'll be towels in the back room in the back of the shower. Hurry up and do that because I don't want you to get sick, okay? So James, in the meantime, he jumps in the shower. He does what Mr. Whipple says. He throws his swimming trunks out, and he's waiting for other clothes to come in. He goes to the back looking for towels to dry off after he gets out the shower, and guess what? No towels. He comes back to the entry point of the shower room that leads outside, and he screams out, Mr. Whipple, Mr. Whipple, I need some clothes. Mr. Whipple doesn't respond. Ten minutes later, he yells out, he yells out again, Mr. Whipple, Mr. Whipple. Mr. Whipple doesn't respond. So finally, James comes out with no clothes on, covering himself up as best he can, and Mr. Whipple is standing right there. Young man, I have never had a junior camp staff come out with no clothes on. If your parents found out what you did, you'd be in a world of trouble. Take these clothes, give me those trunks, and get dressed and go to your room. The next day, James, not quite sure of what to make about what just happened, is very tentative as he's cleaning up after lunchtime. Ordinarily, he had been affirmed by Mr. Whipple, punched on the shoulder, patted on the back, told what a great job he was doing, but this time Mr. Whipple looks at him and through him like he's not even there. He picks up the, sw the towels after swimming pool time. Mr. Whipple gives him no attention whatsoever. Remember, he's been wearing that T-shirt, Junior Camp Staff. So the other campers really aren't associating with him that much because they're probably thinking in the back of their mind that James is a narc, a stoolie, a snitch. And so when it comes down to having that pillow fight at night, guess who's not going to be invited to participate? James, because he's junior camp staff. So the next day, James goes through his routine. He picks up after, swim, after lunch, and Mr. Whipple approaches him. Young man, I've been thinking about what to do about your situation. I don't know if we should just kick you out of this camp because of what you did the other day. You took advantage of me. We're going to have to talk about this after the children are asleep. Do you understand? 
So after the children are asleep, Mr. Whipple comes to get James. And he says this. James, I'm going to keep your secret. I don't want you to get in trouble. But there's some other things that are going to have to happen for me to keep your secret. Do you understand? James is now thinking that he's responsible for his own victimhood. Mr. Whipple is now using the first incident of sexual abuse as leverage to reoffend and perp on James again. Folks, what you just witnessed is something we call the victim selection process. There are various steps within that whole process that leads towards victims. And we are back, and we're here to recap what just happened with our role play today. And now, you said there are specific steps that go on, you know, when there's a sexual predator involved. Can you tell us about the steps that you're actually talking about? Yes, there are actually five steps, and two of the five steps have two parts or multiple parts to it. Mm -hmm. First is called the intent, the perpetrator's mindset. They know exactly what they're doing, and it's very clear. Uh, it translates through their demeanor and their behavior. The second uh, uh, aspect is called uh, things actus reus, and that's things that they do prior to commission of the crime. Mm. Uh, they go out and they acquire tools, camera equipment, whatever, to take pictures or video clips of children. Uh, and then after the intent, which there are two types, actus reus and what's called mens reus, there's called interview. The interview is into two parts. It's one is called silent interview and the other is called overt. Mm. The silent interview is when the predator just observes children. This is the person that drives through a community at the end of the day and he's looking for children that walk home all alone. He will even watch them go up to their front door to determine whether or not they're a latchkey kid. Uh, upon getting that information, that lets him know that that's the type of victim he wants to go forward with. So the next type of interview is where he gets in the child's physical space and offers them something or asks for something, usually help. Mm -hmm. Can you help me find my puppy? Mm -hmm. Asking for help puts the child in the demeanor that they're thinking that this person is not harmful or not capable of hurting them because they appear to be helpless, needing help. Mm -hmm. And so once that's done, the perpetrator seeks to get the child into a position where their options are cut off from stopping the predator from doing what they intend to do and then the sexual assault takes place and then the last step is the reaction that's the sexual perpetrator predator pedophiles plan to get away with it so those are the steps and each of those steps you saw actually acted out with James mm -hmm. so uh, I'd just like to ask uh, both of you yeah. Where did the predator do things prior to the event that prepared him for the victimization? Well, he was spoiling. I don't know why he came to me. It was just picking me out of all the children. Uh huh. I didn't find myself special at all. You came in and gave me all these things. Okay, what were you first given? This t-shirt. A t-shirt. So look, that falls under the intent actus reus. The perpetrator had to physically go to a store, buy a t-shirt, have letters printed on it. All that was done prior to the commission and even selection of the victim. It's part of his preparation. Now let's go to interview. Uh, where did the silent interview take place? In the bathroom, in the bedroom, or no, after the... Back up, back up just a little bit. In the swimming pool. Before then, Actually, remember I said, the predator was paying attention to all the campers that were getting off the bus and he identified one that was special to him because of what? He, the kids were picking, uh, looking at him. Mm -hmm. You were all alone. Yeah. You weren't connected or hanging around anybody else. So you made a good victim, right? Antisocial. Mm -hmm. Then when he convinced you to wear that t-shirt, mm -hmm. that further caused you to be isolated from the rest of the children, right? Right. So that's very methodical. So now, let me ask you this question. Mm. Where did the first sexual assault take place? In the, in the pool, locker room? Or? 
that's a big ticket item, Christina, mm -hmm. but there was sexual assault that took place before that. Mm -hmm. When he first approached him. And what did he do? Give the t-shirt. There was or something the right after that. Oh, give him the privileges. Remember when he first congratulated you for doing a good job? Mm -hmm. He punched you on the shoulder, kind of so like the manly for macho what? thing. Mm -hmm. But then the second time he affirmed you, he did something different. What was that? He rewarded you. Oh. Remember this? Mm. Oh, feeling, yeah. That was a caress. Yeah. That's crossing the line. Yeah, right there. And see, what predators do is they're not going to come right up at you and say, drop your pants, pull right. up your skirt. They're yeah. not going to do that. The it's a subtle buildup. And once he saw, and I, saw, I noticed that when I, in the role of Mr. Whipple, did that to you in this role play, mm -hmm. I saw in your face that it kind of creeped you out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what the predator is doing is testing the temperature. If I can get this far with you, okay, now I know I can go to the next step. Mm -hmm. So that's where the first sexual assault took place, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That was not a benign touch. Okay? Right. Then after that, it was inviting him to go to the swimming pool, but when the other kids were asleep. So now we got positioning, mm -hmm. right? I've already asked for your help mm -hmm. to help us with picking up towels, right? That's the request. I've given you a t-shirt. That's the offer, right? I've made you feel, feel special. I've given you flattery. That's the offer. Now I've got you in position. All the other kids are asleep. I got you in the swimming pool. And then I come up with this con game. Kids use the bathroom and pools all the time, mm -hmm. right? Biohazard bag, really? <laughs> but he's 12. Mm -hmm. No parent has taught him about situations. Like that. So he doesn't even <laughs> see it coming. So now he's in the shower after this ruse, this con game. Mm -hmm. He's thrown his swimming trunks out. He has no clothes, no towels in the back. That's the second sexual assault. Mm -hmm. He comes out with no clothes on, and the perpetrator views him. Mm -hmm. That's called voyeurism. Many times parents think that sexual assault has to be penetration. Right. No, it could be exposing a child to pornography. Mm -hmm. That could be the prelude to sexual victimization through penetration. So I touched him inappropriately. I viewed him, or not me, but mm -hmm. Mr. Whipple, mm -hmm. viewed him. And then something else is going to happen after the predator makes him feel like he's responsible for his own victimhood. He's going to use that as leverage to go further. Mm. And here's the other trick, and then I'd like for mm -hmm. you to just see what yeah. you want to ask James in terms of how he felt mm -hmm. and if you have any comments sure. about what you witnessed. Once a child has been sexually, physically assaulted, the other tricky part in the mind of the child is what happens if it feels good. Mm -hmm. Now the mind and body are playing tricks on each other. The child is saying, in my heart, in my soul, I know something is wrong, but it felt good. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing that the perpetrator, predator, pedophile will play upon to make the victim feel like they really enjoyed it. And if you enjoyed something, even though you felt it was wrong, now it's your fault. Mm -hmm. It's very insidious. Yeah. So with that said, it, yeah. that's the... Per the I mean, the, the guy go. <laughs> How did you feel put in that role, or awkward. playing that role? Awkward. awkward first. Could you see the mind games that were yeah. that he was mm -hmm. doing? Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Especially when he was touching me, like, why? <laughs> it wasn't necessary. And then given the T-shirt, even I felt something was wrong. Yes. That's a good point because a t-shirt really is a tipping point that mm -hmm. many administrators at school systems, camps, church groups, they don't identify early. And if they had identified that one thing you identified as being inappropriate, me giving you a t-shirt, they could have stopped me and fired me right away. Wow. Because really, 
that was the first sign that Mr. Whipple is not right mm -hmm. because he actually said, I do something the other camp staffers don't do. I give my junior camp staff a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. So now he's letting you know that he's operating outside of protocol. That's the first red flag. So if you had to ca like capture for us what we need to look out for, the like five main points, you know, out of the whole role play, what's the most important thing to know to make sure we take away from this? Okay. Well, the first thing is, again, revisiting what we shared earlier, mm -hmm. Christina, and that is by the time a perpetrator, predator, pedophile is caught the first time, they have no criminal record. Mm -hmm. Number two, they victimize on average 32 people. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, of those 32, they're not coming forward because they feel responsible for their own victimhood. And nobody wants to get themselves in trouble if they've been conned into believing their victimization was their fault. Mm -hmm. And so what we gotta do is we gotta teach administrators to recognize when they're people they've employed to be ch have charge over children are stepping outside protocols, even in subtle ways. How children are responding when they're in certain adults' presence. If the children appear to be creeped out a little bit, or they say things in passing, uh, you know, Mr. Whipple is just kind of odd the way he interacts with James. Don't let that drop. It's a very subtle slip that adults have to pay attention to and follow up on before something terribly bad go happens. So it's really about paying attention and having that close ear in mind to your children and communicating with your children openly. Absolutely. Is what it sounds like. Well, thank you so much. That role play was awesome. We appreciate your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you, and thank, thank you. you for playing the role. <laughs> we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. You can uh, see my therapist, so take care of you outside. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and we are signing off Tri-C's Channel 1. Have a great evening.